big change when we look at going from writing to print. Um, here I want to quote from Victor Hugo who argued that in uh, his book The Hunchback of Notre Dame that this will destroy that, but this was the book and that was the cathedral. The book will destroy the cathedral because a medium that is now shareable by millions of people with print means that nobody's going to go to a certain specific place, place to get wisdom or knowledge that it is shareable. And if you look at, if you think about post Gutenberg, we had the Reformation, the American and French revolutions, and a large part of it was dependent on the fact that the large masses of people could now get information that they could check on their own. So Hugo speaks to this, this connection between technology and content when he says, and I'm going to quote just a part of it, the dominant idea of each generation would in future be embodied in new material. Think about that for a second and look at the picture that Matt just sent to me. That a new material, that of the digital computer, changes things. And so we went from clay to papyrus to scrolls to handwritten texts, printed and let type, mass produced books, and now we are at the age of the Kindle and the ebook. And of course, we live now in a world of links and hypertext. And so technology not just changes practices, but it also changes society. So technology and content have always been related in very complex ways. I think that's sort of the message to take away from this part. So that ends this example. Moving on, we talk about another Schulman move, which we look at pedagogy and technology. <clears throat> um, I think one of the greatest innovations that uh, uh, in education in our lifetime is this one because it allows anybody on the planet with a computer and an internet connection to access vast amounts of information. That is just an amazing, amazing thing. Combine that with this, with possibly the one laptop per child, we are looking at something, a fundamental shift in human cultural evolution. The repercussions of which will be felt, which we won't even realize, I think, for 100 years, and the repercussions will be felt for many, many more. But the example that I want to talk about is much smaller, much more local. Um, we teach an online course using the software called Moodle. I know many of you must know it. Um, and Moodle is an open source online software system. And one of the problems that we face in online learning and online teaching, I'm sure those of you have taught online and most of you must have, know is what we call the I agree phenomenon which is that once a couple of students have made a few postings, that everybody else just goes on and says, me too. <laughs> okay? And so you, this, you don't get the kind of engaged discussion around topics that you would like. Well, Moodle does one thing that allows us to get over this I agree phenomenon. What Moodle lets you do is in a discussion forum is prevent you from seeing other people's postings till you have posted your own. Think about that for a second. So any student who's going to post on a certain discussion topic that you have raised is for that per practical purpose the first one posting. So the pressure is on them to do a good job. Moment the post, they can see what other people have said. Now this is an affordance that technology gives us that we may not have been able to do even in a face-to-face -face situation. And that's a really powerful thing. <clears throat> Now there's another thing that people speak of when they speak of online learning. It is that the learning never stops. Well, that's not really true. Because you have the student has to go and log on to the website in order to get it. So we wondered about that. And we said, okay, what is a technology that students are always, pretty much always interacting with? And that's Facebook. So this semester, one of our uh, graduate students is here who is working with us on this. And we are teaching a course where we have two sections, one where the discussions are in Moodle, the other where the discussions are going on in Facebook. Now think about what it means from the student point of view. They go to their Facebook site and there's a little message saying, oh, there have been some discussions going on in your, this course. Suddenly, the learning process is a part of their everyday life. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Whether they like it or not, we are waiting to find out. But there are interesting issues available here. And, so, and we are studying right now how this changes the social and educational discourse just by moving one technology to the other. So back again to our good friends. If this will go, thank you. 
So one thing that we have argued that each of these is messy, right? But we are still forgetting something. So what did we forget? <laughs> you know, I need to get some way of shutting him up. <laughs> one thing that we forgot is these three always work within specific contexts. That these contexts matter a great deal. Consider, for instance, the situation of one laptop per child. How does that change how you teach? Or this classroom in India, which has one computer lab where you might get 30 minutes twice a week, you know, with spotty, if any, internet connection. How does that change what you do? Or the situation in many schools here in the U.S. where students and teachers are restricted from accessing information and websites due to firewalls. We've had that issue come up at MSU right now where some of the technology people are trying to stop the use of Google Docs and you know, stuff like that. Um, and that's a problem, we can see. So, with it, so each institution, each classroom is a context and that becomes critical when we think about this. So a moment to take stock, to sum up, teaching with technology is complex because CPT and messy and let's not forget the overlaps, with incomplete and often contradictory information with no stopping rule. And when I say that no stopping rule means we never know as educators when we are done. Did we get every kid, did every kid or every person in my class understand what it is that I want to say? We never really know that. So any solutions that we come up with are typically not right or wrong, but good or bad. We can't make absolute judgments, we can make relative judgments. And they are unique and context dependent. And finally, every solution leads to new problems. So the Facebook example is one where we can do that, then students might rebel against it, or they all go and join. Um, instead of Facebook, they start doing Orkut or something like that, so things change. In short, what we argue is that teaching with technology is wicked. And wicked is a term that we take from Rittle and Weber, and if you want, you can go back and look at it, but the way they define what a wicked problem is, it seems to us that teaching with technology is a classic example of that. So what is the solution to that? One thing we know is that standard approaches don't work. We look for a royal road to teaching or the yellow brick road to teaching, and we know that there is none. So, that brings us back to our refrain. All right, number two. Wicked problems require creative solutions. Well, clearly we live in a new media ecology, one that is characterized by change. <clears throat> and this change, as, this, as Matt just sent me this image, he's very good at Google, you can see. He finds this right away and sends it to me. Um, in, a, in, a, in an environment characterized by change, it becomes critical, it becomes a question almost of survival, of how you survive in this new environment. So we ask this really profound question. This is a really deep question. I think the deepest question we're going to ask today here. What can we learn from a fish? <laughs> I'd like to introduce all of you to a very interesting little fish. This is the Trinidadian guppy. It lives in a range of environments, some stable, some less so. And therefore, it has developed a flexible reproductive strategy. When the times are good and things are going well, there's not much fluctuation in the environment, it produces fewer babies because it can take care of them. But when times are bad, it does something different. It has lots of babies. Because it knows that it cannot support all of them, and so it knows that many of them would die, so that's a really good strategy. And so the question is, so? So, in a world characterized by change, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of good ideas. So in that sense, creativity becomes key to surviving in this new media ecology. All right. But what is creativity? 